This is Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. From the corporate office to the cab of a truck, they're here to inspire and empower women in all professions. So gear down, sit back, and enjoy. Welcome to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy DeCaro. We're a show that works to inspire and empower women in every profession and lifestyle. Whether you're at home, in the office, or in the cab of a truck, we help power you on the road to success. We tackle all kinds of topics and work to encourage women to be their very best with informative guests and women who've been champions. I'm Shelley. And I'm Kathy. No topic is taboo on our rig. We tackle the tough topics along with the not-so-tough topics. And we like to feature experts and celebrities who can assist women in being the best they can be. Are you a high-octane, high-achiever who seems to be spinning out of control? Do you feel overwhelmed or have obstacles that keep tripping you up? Do you have difficulty fitting in a personal life? Too many times, women take on more than they should. They want to do it all, and they end up engaging in self-sabotage. Often, they're perfectionists and fail to recognize their own milestones and their true value. They can suffer from limiting beliefs or imposter syndrome or not set realistic goals, so they end up seriously frustrated. Kamini Wood is the creator of Authentic Me. She's also the CEO of Live Joy Your Way. She's a certified life coach who's trained in internal family systems and cognitive behavioral-based coaching. She helps high performers and overachievers reestablish their self-awareness, and she's assisted healthcare workers, lawyers, executives, and any other high performer find balance between work and their personal lives. We have Kamini with us today to offer her insight. Welcome, Kamini. Thank you for being on the show with us. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you're welcome. You're... Your service is so certainly needed. It seems like lately we're in a high octane world where everyone's in overdrive. We end up like the ever ready rabbit banging into walls if we don't watch out. What are you seeing with people today, especially with women? Oh, what you just said is spot on. What I'm seeing are, especially with women, is the overcommitment, the constant need to go and do and do some more. More often than I can count, I am talking to individuals. My clients are coming to me saying they have that narrative that says, well, if I don't do it, something bad's going to happen. One of my clients actually used a metaphor recently, and it really just hit me. She said, it's like I'm on a speeding train, but if I get off or if I stop it, everything's going to fall apart. And I really think that that's the belief. And that's the, well, I, I refer to it as a false belief, but I do believe that that's the narrative that we're working with, which is this true fear that if we don't, if we allow ourselves to stop, or we don't keep doing and doing and doing, things are going to fall apart. Um, and, and I think that that's where we're starting to see things like burnout and overwhelm, chronic stress. We're seeing it come up in physical ailments. It's just, it seems to be the new constant. You think it's the uncertainty of the times? I mean, the pandemic really set off a domino effect. I do. I think that uncertainty has a lot to do with, I think it's our innate need to control or to know how things are going to unfold. And I believe that the pandemic offered so much uncertainty that it almost sent us all into um, almost overdrive, almost like a trauma effect where we were so traumatized by the uncertainty that now we're going to the polar opposite where it's, we're trying to control all the things and we're trying to get ourselves to certainty that we're actually overdoing and overscheduling ourselves. Makes sense. Well, I think humans want security. Isn't that kind of our, our core belief or our, it's just who we are? We have to be safe. Oh, absolutely. I think we are striving for safety. Um, I often say that my North star in life is emotional safety. I do believe that we, as humans, we want security. There is this innate need to feel safe and secure. And what we have trained ourselves to do is to try to get that out of or through control or through certainty. And what we have forgotten is the idea that we can also, we can, we can access security and safety within ourselves. We can access it through things like self-trust. We don't necessarily have to know how things are going to unfold to feel safe. 
you have some tremendous insight. What inspired you to go in the direction you have to help people? And what is authentic me? I love that question. And I really appreciate that compliment. Uh, What inspired me was actually my own journey. Um, professionally, I had found myself in every role that I had, I was running the project management office for a dot com many years ago. But even in that role, I found myself pulled towards talking to people about what they needed and helping them figure out how they could grow and evolve in order to get the project to completion. Then went on to run a law firm and still found myself in the role of helping individuals figure out what they wanted out of their career and eventually help them to figure out what they wanted in their personal life and how to complete and find that balance. But more, moreover, it was my personal journey and experience. I myself am a high achiever. I'm a perfectionist and a people pleaser. And I recognized it actually through my children's eyes. So I'm also a mom of five. My Oldest is 22. My Five. Is 10. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, had, I had to stop for a second. I'm like, what? <gasps> yeah, my old my oldest is actually a professional ballerina now. She uh dances in Virginia. And then my youngest is, is started or well, she's in her fifth grade year, so she's finishing elementary school. So I've got the gamut in between there. But it was really my children who I was starting to see myself mirrored or them mirroring back to me how I was showing up. Mm. So they were showing up as these people pleasers, these perfectionists, really worrying so much about making sure everybody was out, everyone else was okay. So these over functioners, when I was able to witness them do that, I realized that was, that was coming from me. So I really put in that work to figure out what was going on for me. Where did that narrative come from? How is it potentially holding me back? And through that work, so you take that personal experience, you take where I, what I was really finding myself enjoying from a professional perspective and realize that that was actually my calling. I was meant to go through some of these experiences. I was meant to work through these things that I can now pay it forward. I can work with others. I can be their witness and help them understand themselves on a deeper level so that they can also move forward. This is terrific. You know, We really do, growing up, we kind of mirror our parents, don't we? We absolutely do. (laughs) There are times when I wish they didn't wear, they didn't mirror me so much. You know, (laughs) growing up, I'm sorry, I I, I look look for so much approval from my mother that I would even buy the clothes that she wanted me to wear, not because I liked them, because she liked them, right? Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. (laughs) And we mimic them. I've looked in the mirror before and seen my mother and gone, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, how did I absorb that? But that's how we learn growing up as very little ones, you know. Oh, absolutely. Because that's that's our, you know, well, first of all, our parents are our our guiding light, right? That we're looking sure. to them for how we should show up. And so we're going to pick those things up. I too will absolutely admit that there are moments where things come out of my mouth right now. And I'm like, where, where did my mom just come from? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. When did she get into this conversation? Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. It, it is interesting how I I've done that. Uh, I'll say something and I, I'd heard it decades before mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. how is this stored in my brain yes <laughs> yes <laughs> so so true uh, and then there was those moments where I'm like I realized well, how wise my parents were <laughs> yes yeah yeah oh yeah when we're under 21 we think that they've got a lot to learn and once we turn 21 uh-huh. we're amazed at how much they have learned <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I love the insight you've got on your website. One of the things that's on your homepage, it says, our core beliefs are formed at a young age and they may just not be true. That can basically prevent us from pursuing our goals. That's kind of what I got out of what you have there. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, so often we don't talk about how between the ages of zero to seven, essentially, we are these fishbowls where these open, our subconscious is kind of open to absorb experiences and messages that we're having and they get internalized and we make meaning of it. Again, not intentionally. It's just how we are as little children. And then around the age of eight or thereabouts, you know, the conscious mind kind of covers closes that fishbowl up and then everything is filtered through those narratives and those beliefs. So for me, as an example, growing up in a predominantly white town, immigrant parents, 
a name like Comedy did not was obviously looked different and um, my name was different, went to school. So between the ages of five and six, I had assimilated through the experience and what I was being told messages I was receiving. You are different. You don't belong. That was internalized. I overcompensated through people pleasing and a little bit of perfectionism, because again, if I didn't mess up, I wasn't drawing attention to myself. So I was no longer different or I was working towards this idea of belonging that's just a small example. So the false belief around, I don't believe had taken hold and only through the work was I able to recognize that, that narrative and how that doesn't serve me. The constant needing to overfunction in order to prove worthiness was, was not serving me. It may have served me when I was in grade school, but it no longer was something that I needed to live into. Great insight. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors, coming up. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. Are you a high achiever in overdrive who just can't slow down? Women are often very guilty of doing this. They take on too much and they scramble from one task to the next. Achieving a work-life balance and success at the same time is possible. Kamini Wood, creator of Authentic Me and the CEO of Live Joy Your Way, is showing us how. Kamini, do you think that self-sabotage, perfectionism, imposter syndrome, or not setting realistic goals, does that really start to evolve when we're kids? I think the seeds are planted, the seeds are planted, and then it depends how much they're watered, right? How, how that, that inner dialogue, the inner critic, especially with imposter syndrome, a lot of it is I'm not good enough, or I, I got here by luck, or it was by a fluke. All of that, if we think about it is we dial that back to I'm, I'm undeserving or I'm not good enough. And again, that comes from potentially, and I'm not saying every false belief was between zero and seven, because we're, we're having experiences all through life. So, but a lot of them get planned, especially those core ones of, of not being enough. We usually can trace them back to some type of experience or message. I'm not saying a hundred percent of the time, but a lot of the times. Do women suffer from this more than men? As a woman, I probably am a little biased. I, I think that we Women probably do suffer for it, suffer from it at a little bit higher of a rate. However, working with men, I know that they absolutely suffer from it as well. It's not just gender specific. Um, I think with motherhood, uh, a lot of women will have a new layer of it that pops on. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I'm not saying that fathers don't, but I just, in my experience, I have definitely seen women experience especially the the fear of failure or the imposter syndrome at really high rates. Well, you know, when you think about it, you have a child and they don't come with a set of instructions. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know? So you just you feel like you're wandering around blindly and there would be worry that would set in. I mean, that's the maternal instinct to protect your child. Yeah. So I could see where some of these doubts, self-doubts could emerge. Oh, absolutely. Oh, gosh. If they did come with a manual, I routinely joke with my kids and tell them, you know, I'm winging this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm giving it a shot. (laughs) Giving it a shot. Giving it my best effort here, kids. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And they constantly change. So you have to constantly adapt. You know, I mean, a a toddler is totally different than a teenager, but they still don't want to (laughs) listen. So true. So true. Although I do joke with my oldest son, he threw some pretty knockdown uh, tantrums as a younger kid. I now he's almost 20 and I joke with him and say, yep, it's just the adult version of the tantrum. <laughs> <laughs> so on your website, you talk about cognitive restructuring 
And I see that there are three key elements to that or three key steps. Did you want to maybe go over, over some of that? Because that really helps, I guess, people develop a more accurate image of themselves. With cognitive restructuring, I, I the very first thing that we have to recognize is that awareness is the key, right? So we don't, we can't really work on anything if we're not aware of what's happening. So I routinely will say to people, awareness is that doorway to change. Once you take the time to become aware of what's happening, that's when you're at that that choice point where you can decide what and how you want to move forward. And when we're talking about cognitive restructuring, what we're really talking about is creating new neural pathways. So the beliefs that we have are essentially, uh, if we were to give it a metaphor, they are essentially these paved highways that are, you know, straight shot. We can put ourselves on cruise control, autopilot, however you want to look at it, and we just can go. When we're working on cognitive restructuring, what we're challenging ourselves to do is to recognize, so we're aware of this narrative, we recognize that that no longer serves us, we make a choice as to how we want to shift or what committed actions we're going to take, and then we, we are essentially pushing ourselves to get off of that highway and to go down a dirt path that has not been paved. And, and our brains are going to want so badly for us to go back on the known path. And it's about staying committed, taking down, going down that dirt path over and over and over again, until it actually starts smoothing itself out. As it's smoothing itself out, what well, that's a the equivalent to is building that new neural pathway. So it's not really about getting rid of the old one. It's about how can we, through neuroplasticity, create new neural pathways that then serve us better than the old the old mechanism that we were using. And I see visualization uh, is is real important. I would think all of these different steps are really uncharted territory for a lot of people. They really have to work at it. It is work. I mm. often will say to individuals that, you know, coaching is not a um, going through a coaching process or working on yourself is not for those who are wanting to kind of watch from the stands. Like you're in the, as Brene Brown says, you're getting in the arena. You're doing the work because when you do the work, that is when changes can happen. And only you can choose to do the work for yourself and only you can decide how you want to change and how you want to grow. And I would that think, is so true. Yeah. So, so, so true. And I would think everyone could benefit from this, not just overachievers, because I think that human beings always have maybe a little bit of self-doubt and they tend to self-sabotage. I wholeheartedly agree with you. I don't think it's just overachievers. I think us all as humans, you know, us being human beings, the self-doubt will creep in. We have that part of us, you know, the, the fear of, you know, people will talk about the fear of missing out. It's really become the fear of messing up for a lot of people. Uh, and really what that comes down to is again, wanting to be accepted, you know, as human beings or relational beings, we want to be part of the tribe. Mm -hmm. And so that, that self-doubt will absolutely creep in and self-sabotage for that effect too. I often will say that self-sabotage is a protection mechanism. We will self-sabotage to almost try to control the fallout or to um, somehow be able to protect ourselves. It's almost like we, we are bracing for the impact. So we're, we, will self-sabotage so that we know that we're about to be impacted. Uh, an example would be in a relationship, you know, you're in this relationship, things are going well, and then you, you will, you find yourself either cheating or doing something to self-sabotage a relationship. And then you're like, why did I do that? A lot of times, if we really unpack it, it's because there is a fear of potentially getting hurt, or maybe there's a narrative of, I don't deserve the love, whatever is underneath it, what we recognizes that self-sabotaging behavior was actually a protection mechanism because if I'm able to know that that is about to happen, that the relationship's going to implode, I can somehow, some, the thought is I can protect myself. And in the end, it still hurts, right? So again, self-sabotage is this way that we try to control the fallout. And in the end, it's just, it's recognizing that we will go through challenges in life. And it, we come back to that, what I said earlier, self-trust, learning to to accept yourself and all its elements and all its parts and know that you can work through whatever challenge comes your way. These are great principles, introspection, deconstruction, and visualization with the cognitive restructuring. And mm -hmm. in visualization, is that basically thinking about who you are or what you want to be? It's really coming into this place of 
seeing yourself as you want to be, you know, who you believe yourself to be and really, really leaning into that. Um, when we can't, or we don't allow ourselves to see ourselves that way, we're actually uh, holding ourselves back. So it's, it's seeing it and then taking the committed actions to live into that, that person. And of course, that's a step after deconstruction, which is questioning the limiting beliefs mm -hmm. you might have. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of benefits from what you have listed. It increases your awareness. Uh, that That's always a good thing. <laughs> it's always a good thing to be more aware. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, but, but as you, as you deconstruct it, you know, you're building your awareness, but I also believe that deconstruction allows for the pathway to self-acceptance and self-acceptance is really saying, I accept all the parts of myself imperfections and all. So when we deconstruct, we are opening that doorway to that as well, giving ourselves permission to accept all parts of ourself. Which is really hard to do easier said than done. I know Absolutely. like uh, I went into a women's treatment center when I was 40 for the first time and uh, it was a year long program and I literally had to take a break from life just due to extensive trauma that was undealt with over 40 years and which honestly was the best thing I could have ever done for myself. I just this place was strictly for women. You lived there. You had your own apartment. You had Monday to Friday therapy from nine to four. And then you had, you know, chores and volunteer work and whatever you had to do, right? There's 25 mm -hmm. of us l living together, which is a challenge in itself. <laughs> different, <laughs> different levels of PMS going on all at once. But, <laughs> anyway, um, but it was there that I learned all about, um, actually, no, I had to unlearn <laughs> everything mm. that had been brainwashed into me it, my whole all my beliefs since I was a kid that I was no good and useless and you know never amount to nothing I'm fat I'm ugly whatever right and then I had to unlearn all that which was one thing but what they did is they re they, they retaught you how to who who I am I had to relearn who Kathy really really was and that was really interesting because honestly, even at 40, I didn't know what I liked, what I didn't like. I had to ask, I, I had to ask the counselor what the word boundaries meant. Mm -hmm. right? And yes. I didn't know what codependency meant. Like I, I was just shocked. And I'm like, what you mean? Like all this time, like, are you kidding me? But the hardest part about all this was um, accepting it, accepting mm -hmm how awesome I really am and accepting the qualities. Yes, I, of course, because I spent my whole life focusing on, on everything I was doing wrong. Well, what about everything that I'm doing right? And look, look, you, you, you rock, you, you do this, and you do that. And, and so that was a real, a real big shift that doesn't happen overnight, but it, it's, I think it's the concept of being open to, to it. You know, whereas yes, yeah. a lot of people just go through life thinking, oh, well, this is it. And and this is getting back to what you were saying about that personal awareness. I think it's if you want to change and grow, you need to have that. You need to do that introspection about who you really are and and not what you are, what your spouse wants or your kids want or mm -hmm. or 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 any of that. Right. Yes, I mean, it, absolutely. it's challenging. It's challenging. But man, is it rewarding? Because now it's like, Whoa, look at me go, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it is it is challenging work. But I love something that you, you were talking about, which is really coming back. What I heard you say in a different way was coming back home to yourself. And so often we go into adulthood and we haven't taken the time to actually ask ourselves, what are our core values or what are the actual core beliefs I have about myself? Do those beliefs really resonate with me? Are they serving me? Are they beneficial to me? And then the other part are your core needs. Mm -hmm. My needs as an individual person, not as a mom or a wife or a friend or a daughter or whatever role we're playing but as, as a human being, because those three things allow that room for that reconnection with self that you just so eloquently spoke about when that experience. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, is building a positive image of trucking by telling the story of the hardworking drivers and industry professionals who support the industry. And you can be a part of it. Learn more about TMAF and how you can join and be a part of the industry movement working to build a strong image of trucking by visiting TMAF's website at truckingmovesamerica.com. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our latest channel, TikTok. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. Many women are perfectionists and overachievers. This leads them down the road to a dead end of burnout and self-doubt, and it interferes with their success. Much of this counterproductive behavior is based on core beliefs that we establish as children. There are ways to circumvent this process and show up for yourself. Cognitive restructuring is a key element in this change. Kamini Wood is a consultant who helps high achievers attain their true potential using this method. Kamini, you are so insightful. Very insightful. When, when you began your career, was this something you always had as an inherent skill? Or was it just something that you realized through your own experiences that this was something you really needed to develop to help other people? Well, first of all, thank you so much for that compliment. I'm really going to take that one in. Uh, This has been something that I, I believe is just part of my being. Um, I have always tried to show up in a way that truly is listening and uh, actively engaged with the person that I'm in conversation with. And so through that, um, I feel as though what you're referring to as insights just start, they just kind of come to me. (laughs) Which is terrific. You know, there are a lot of people who can't do that. I think a lot of people just kind of go through life and they don't even hear others or they don't observe their environment. Uh, It's really kind of weird. Uh, Maybe that's why zombie movies are so popular. They're so (laughs) popular, aren't they? (laughs) (laughs) It is one of the things that I've often said when people ask me, what is the strength that I see of myself? I do think that I'm, I, I'm not just empathic, I'm highly sensitive and I really do try to be with people. I think at times I have had to, I've had to work on my own boundaries in terms of energetic boundaries of not taking on too much. Um, but I agree with you. I think that sometimes we forget to actually listen to the person who's sitting in front of us. Mm. Yeah, we do. Um, and of course, women will complain that men do that a lot. They just go, uh-huh, yes, honey, <laughs> that kind of uh-huh. thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But it's something that humans have to work on, actually interacting when they communicate, for sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was doing a talk recently on leadership, and one of the things that I, I mentioned was uh, the concept of an, an empathetic leadership. And what that also includes is working on the skill of actively listening to the person who's sitting in front of you, because I do think that it's something that we don't, we don't talk about very often, uh, but that part of emotional intelligence is so, so important in relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think when people are communicating, they have this subtext, they're anticipating what they're going to say to the other person as the other person's talking rather than actively listening. You are so, so right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're planning out their response. (laughs) Yeah. And and it's almost like they think it's a sports tournament or something. It's like, okay, what's my next move? You know, um, Mm -hmm. I'm not on the field here. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not effective. Oh, gosh, it's not effective at all. And as a matter of fact, it's like two ships passing in the night, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're almost having two totally separate conversations. Sure. Yeah. So in, in terms of overachievers who you said, I've read in your background, you've worked a lot with, what are some of the basic things for an overachiever who might be listening that they need to consider so that they can stop going around in circles? <laughs> one of the one of the very first things I challenge my overachieving clients to ask themselves is what what's the why, you know, especially when they're doing uh give me the, the, tell me, share with me, what's the why behind that? Because more often than not with overachievers, we're going to find out that it's proving worth. Uh, That's usually the why behind it. I have to do this. Why? Because I'm, you know, we go down the list and eventually we get to, well, because then I'm worthy. So that's usually what I will say to overachievers is slow it down. Ask yourself, what's your why? And when I'm asking that question, I'm asking, what's your your personal meaning behind the things that you're engaging in. If you can identify your value or the why something is meaningful to you, then it makes sense to continue doing it. But if the why is based in trying to prove worthiness or enoughness, that's an invitation to do some some introspection. Okay. 
So you essentially need to do things for yourself rather than always for other people. Yes, which I know a lot of people say, comedy, that's very selfish. And to that, I respond with, it's a selfful act when we we take care of what's happening inside of us. Yeah. We show up in a totally different way when we're yeah. in relationship with others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Self-care yeah. is not selfish. It's not. No, it's not. You know, I, I lost my nursing career because I lost myself in all my patients problems and uh, totally forgot my own. You know, I would mm. take care of everybody else's needs and not mine. And by the time I get home at night, I'm so burned out that I just, you know, well, back then I used to drink and <laughs> drop dead. But um, yeah, it's and yeah. it took me until I was 40 to realize, wait a minute, I, I got to come first. Right. And so that's mm-hmm. why I don't, I'm not a nurse anymore. I just one of the reasons is that mm-hmm. I knew I needed a career where I, I take care of me <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, first. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I can't. I cannot express the number of people that I've worked with that really did believe that self-care was selfish. And we've really had to break that one Mm -hmm. down and work Mm -hmm. through that. Um, Because I think it really does keep people from, from taking care of themselves. Cause I think it's a selfish act. And also one of the other things I talk about a lot is self-compassion and I get the same response, but that's selfish. And I challenge that with, well, how is compassion? is compassion to others. You know, when you're compassionate to others, is that selfish? Well, you're just offering yourself that same kindness. And when you mm-hmm. offer yourself that same kindness, you're actually building yourself up again, then you can actually engage in healthier relationships with people because you're not coming from such a depleted place. It's interesting how society has conditioned people that if you take time to take care of yourself, that's selfish. Uh, you're mm-hmm. being self-centered and they have all of these negative terms just to take care of yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. You can't present well. You can't do anything. It really is counterproductive, the messages we have pounded into our heads. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's counterproductive. They, it's just, it leads us down the path of burnout. Honestly, Um, I know as as a mom, that's one of the things that we hear all the time. You know, the the mom who has availability in her calendar somehow is considered uh, lazy versus the mom who's overbooked as a go getter. And that's you know, wow, where did that come from? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a that's a a a a result of different messages we received from society and culture. Sure. Well, things have gotten a lot more high octane for parents when you think about it. As kids get older in school, they've got all these competitions and parents are running them here, there, everywhere else. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did that 40, 50 years ago. Um, By the time they're done at at the end of the day, you know, you're working full time. A lot of times both parents are working. You're totally frazzled. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I I admit it. That's been our our world. Um, As I mentioned, my oldest is a professional ballerina and I just remember all of the dance uh, classes and things that she had to go through. My second oldest is a division one athlete in school, same concept tournaments um, because he plays lacrosse. So we had tournaments to get to games to get to, you know, you have child three, four and five involved in what they're doing. I'm working. My spouse is working. You're right. And it, and what do we really need? We need to, to figure out what, what, can we do what's within our realm and where do we start to say no? What boundaries do we need to set? And over the course, I will say from child one to where I am now, I am much better about learning or at least saying no. I have learned that no is not mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no is is a way to take care of myself and also my family. Absolutely. And when you think about it, when you're running here, running there all the time, this actually trains kids to do that and and it maybe even a faster momentum once they're adults. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Again, we're we're showing our kids, right? They're going to yeah. they're going to mirror, they're going to mirror it back to us. But the school systems are doing it too because they've got so many competitions and so forth. I don't remember when I was in school that it was that active. I mean, there there certainly were um and I was not in athletics, but I was in music and all of that. So I mean, there certainly were activities, but it does seem like Kids are all over the place today. And I mean, they've got to be stressed out too. Mm-hmm. They are. And I, I actually, absolutely. I actually work with teens all the way through mature adults. And one of the things that I will routinely say is those, our teenagers today are 
very stressed out because they are dealing with social pressures. They're dealing with family pressures, academic pressures, at extracurricular type pressures. I mean, they are just getting it from all different aspects. And when you think about it too, the culture of, okay, well, what's next after high school for a majority of individuals, it's about college. Well, then you look at the college application process, mm. which my third child is going through right now. And even the college advisors are, well, you know, we've got to, we, what are you going to put on your, your resume, quote unquote resume for the college. And so this idea of doing, 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 that's also coming from our education system, yeah. you know, overbooking ourselves, participating in everything under the sun. Cause you have to prove and show to the colleges that you're well-rounded. Right. And so yeah. it's, it, they're getting it from that perspective from, you mm. know, the time that they enter, they enter the school system. It seriously is competitive and, and very stressful. I mean, kids in eighth grade are starting to think about college and they have to yep. have that resume. I mean, a resume mm-hmm. was not something probably any of us were really talking about till we graduated nope. from college. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. But these kids that you're absolutely right. Eighth grade is when they start to think about it. They enter into the high school and you know, everything is about what's going to be on your resume. What are you doing? Are you volunteering enough? What sports are you playing? What extracurriculars do you have? Oh, and then by the way, you need to also have a really high GPA, right? Yeah, no pressure there. <laughs> yes. I remember as a kid, I was, um, once I got into middle school, I was really driven to be on the honor roll. And then when I was on the honor roll, I wanted to be on high honors and I wanted to have all A's. I mean, I was just mm-hmm. this driven kid. If mm-hmm. all of that had been thrown at me too, I would have been a serious basket case. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, um, the students that I work with, the teenagers that I work with, they are dealing with some of that not enoughness. Mm-hmm. It's that false belief that, you know, we, I deal with, with my mature adult clients. We're finding it in our teen clients too. And that an, not enoughness, that is so much puberty. You compare mm-hmm. yourself with your peers mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, girls, uh, well, heck, I hated it in the locker room. It's like, um, oh, yeah. if you're not mm-hmm. developed, you're like, oh, what's wrong with me? And then you have the mean girls who will make uh-huh. comments. That yes. Kind of thing, yes. You know? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So all of this is something that just starts to be instilled in us at a young age. So then by the time we get out in the real world, we have all this self-doubt. Mm-hmm. Yes, Exactly. Um, I have seen it evolve from, yes, you're right, middle school. And then we get to high school. It starts to really take hold. My college clients dealing with the same uncertainty. Then, of course, they're trying to get out into the real world, applying for jobs, and they already have all this self-doubt. And so it's overcoming that in working with them through that um, because it, it does. It affects us in all facets of life. <laughs> Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors, coming up. Kathy DeCaro is nothing short of amazing. She not only drives the world's biggest truck as a heavy equipment operator in northern Alberta, Canada, she's an international motivational speaker and the author of Dream Big an autobiography about overcoming a lifetime of trauma and abuse that led to dreams of success. Kathy inspires people the world over to change their lives and improve their self-worth. Her book will change your life. She's passionate about personal growth and believes anyone can change their circumstances and overcome their obstacles if they believe in themselves. Her life will amaze you and seriously inspire you. Be sure to order a copy of her book, Dream Big, on Amazon.com. Industry Movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry, our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of and join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. Self-sabotage is something everyone does at one time or another. We all doubt ourselves. 
Often we engage in self-sabotage to control the fallout, whether it's in a relationship or in our careers. Comedy Wood is an expert at coaching people to stop engaging in these behaviors. She helps overachievers attain their true potential through introspection, deconstruction, and visualization, which we've been talking about. Comedy is the creator of Authentic Me and CEO of Live Joy Your Way. So, Comedy, you've got such great information here. Do people reach out to Authentic Me? How do they reach you? Because I know that you also have a podcast called Rise Up, which is really cool. You've got some tremendous insights in that, too. I was looking at some of the topics. How do people reach out to you? Do you work remotely with them? And I do. I work with people all over the world. I work virtually. So um, when people want to work with me, we're either on video conference or I do have some clients that just prefer phone and we find a way to just make sure that we we work through time zone issues. And if they want to reach out to me, just finding me on the web at commonywood.com. Excellent. I know that there's so much that you have to unpack and we just kind of touched on some of that, but is there maybe a takeaway for women whether they're overachievers or whether they're not, uh, that they should think about as they try to go through their day and maybe feel mm-hmm. better about themselves and get more stability in their life and, and more get rid of the insanity, if you will. Yeah. My loving challenge to those individuals would be to slow down and recognize when you're defining yourself, either as the roles you're playing or the things that you're doing and see if you can look at yourself and recognize yourself for who you are, the essence of your being. So that takes you back to what your core values are, what your core beliefs are, and allow yourself to identify with that rather than only defining yourself by, again, those roles that you're playing or the things that you're doing. That's a really great way to start breaking down the overdoing and overfunctioning in order to prove enoughness or worthiness. Wonderful. That was well said. I love it. I really do. (laughs) That's that was really well said. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and if people want to get some inspiration, they can also listen to your Rise Up, Live Joy Your Way podcast. That's pretty cool. Yes, it's a short mini cast. So if they're also short on time, they're usually only eight to 10 minutes long. <laughs> That's a good meditation on a daily basis, really, when you think about it. The little snippet. That's right. Mm-hmm. A snippet to take through your day. <laughs> so it's nice. Comedy Wood, spelled K A M. I-N-I, wood.com. People can reach you that way. And then you also have Authentic Me. I have uh, an Instagram and a Facebook. The handle for both is It's Authentic Me. It's Authentic Me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Terrific. I like that name. Thank you. Being authentic. You You know, and a lot of people probably don't even know what authentic is. They think they're being authentic when in fact they're not. Maybe they're being somebody else and kind of absorb somebody else's personality or, you know. It's so true, honestly. And it's it's the working through it, letting go, uncovering all those masks that Mm -hmm. we we carry, we put on because we're afraid of really truly showing people who we are, being vulnerable. So it's it's coming back again, coming back home to self. Mm -hmm. This has been terrific comedy. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I have enjoyed my time with both of you wonderful women. You know, I can, I can, I really bet that the the listeners out there are actually doing a lot of self-reflection, you know, as they listen to what you were saying and just the conversation in general, kind of like taking a minute to look at themselves and wonder, hmm, where am I on the scale? Like, what, what am I doing? Like, where, where, what do I, what is it that I need to look at in my own life? You know, and, and that's where it starts. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Kamini. Planting those seeds. (laughs) Planting (laughs) seeds. Absolutely. Got to do that. (laughs) Thank you, Kamini. We hope you've enjoyed this latest episode. And if you want to hear more episodes of Women Road Warriors or learn more about our show, be sure to check out womenroadwarriors.com. And please follow us on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you want to be a guest on the show or have a topic or feedback, email us at sjohnson at womenroadwarriors.com. Mm-hmm.